Welcome to another episode of Not Your Average Lives, and this is one of my Thursday Thoughts episodes, where it's just me. And again, it's a Friday, so it looks like that's going to be the pattern. I am having the thought on Thursday, and then by the time I really think about what it is I want to talk about, I'm so tired and it's too late and I want to give you as much energy as possible. So yesterday I knew what I wanted to talk about, but I thought I just need to be more energetic. So you have a livelier version of me today. And I also wanted to say in the process, so remember uh, last week I said, I'm going to start pulling cards from my energy oracle card deck to prompt my intuition on what topic I need to talk about that will inspire you in some way, shape, or form. Something that comes to mind based on what card I pull. So last week it was a community card and this week's card pool, if you're on video, you can see this. This is this handsome man holding a coin, a gold coin, or it's just as a coin. It's kind of got gold rimmed. I pulled this card and I was like, first of all, he is really handsome. Is he going to be my gift? <laughs> no, my husband's handsome. I would never stray, but, uh, and this guy's too young for me, but he is cute. He is a hot guy. He looks like he belongs on Lord of the Rings. The name of the card is called Man Holding a Coin. So appropriate. So then I turned to my guidebook and any Oracle card where somebody's holding a big old money coin is usually a good sign. So I'll tell you what it said. And oh, by the way, my puppy, because I had pulled the card and I wanted to have my book so I could read what it said, my puppy got it. My puppy is now being bold enough. He's eight months and he's now standing on his hind legs and getting stuff off the coffee table. And he loves anything, especially paper towels. And like if you used a paper towel and you had some little food on it, he lo loves that. But he's now starting to chew paper. So he got my guidebook, which my husband saved. It's got a little tear on the front, but all the pages are still there. And he chewed on my handsome man card, but he didn't chew on the handsome man part. He just chewed around the edges. <laughs> Although now my Oracle card is messed up. All right. So what it said, and when I pulled it and I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, what, what do I need to talk about? And the part that really stood out to me was that... This card upright, which was pulled upright, could also reveal the assistance of a financial advisor or healer whom you already know or are soon to meet. This man is helpful and may bring sage advice concerning the action you need to take next. Be open to this person showing up with support, but always turn to your own intuitive guidance to weigh the information you receive. And so I sat with it and it didn't take long for my intuition to kick in as it does. That's why I love these cards. And what I thought was, OMG, I am in the midst of doing a mind your money challenge. It is a challenge by my mentor, James Wedmore, and it's something that I never have completely gone through. I started it, but didn't finish it a few months ago. He gives so much content sometimes that I'm so busy training on one thing that it's just one more thing. And I was like, I'll put that aside. I'll do it later. But I did start it. And one of the reasons I'll share in a minute why I didn't finish it, but it is 31 days to abundance in action with, with money. So it's 31 lessons and you do them 31 days in a row is the idea and it is supposed to improve your relationship with money and help you get into a place where you understand that money is simply energy and the more abundant you are and the more good energy you put out into the world with respect to money the more abundant you will find it in your life. What's interesting is the first time I did this, the first day is, it overwhelmed me a bit because the first day is you have to go into your bank accounts and figure out what 
all your, your money situation is, how many assets you have, you know, what your income is, what's coming in, what's your expenses are, what's going out. And that is not something I enjoy doing because I would much rather be sitting here talking to you on a podcast. <laughs> and I've always said that I'm not a math person. And so I, I tend to be an avoider with my money. I always have had enough. So I'm lucky in that respect. I've always had enough. I've always had a really great job and made over six figures. I also was lucky enough to be a part of a very fast growing company in AOL. So I had stock. So I was, had a, a lot of uh, stock uh, benefits from being a part of AOL. So I don't monitor my money as closely as I should. My husband's a finance major, which is kind of interesting, but uh, we are, it's our second marriage and we keep our money separate, which is fine with me because <laughs> he doesn't know what I spend my money on. So when I uh, hire a coach like James Wedmore and I spend a lot of money on it, he doesn't know, but he does support me in my business. And he does think that it's been good for me because I'm, I'm loving what I do. So that all is good. But if I had to screen and go to him and say, can you give me some money to do this? Oh, that would be a miserable life. So I've always really had my own money, even with my first marriage. Um, although we had a joint checking account, but I never had to get approval to do anything. I think about back in the fifties and how women were homemakers and they got a budget or they could only have so much money and they had to go ask for it. I, I just think, I would have been a miserable woman if that was me. Maybe I, in another life, I lived that life. And maybe that's why I'm like I am now today. But anyways, one of the things that my mentor has taught me is that your relationship with money is key to your success in life as it relates to money, right? And that our money beliefs. So we have, you know, just like we have beliefs in everything, there are beliefs and they come from our thoughts and our background and our parents and how we were raised with money. Because our belief system it really only applies to us, right? Because it's our life, it's our experiences, it's what we think about things. And what we think about things is based, I've said it before, on our filter, our filter of how things operate and, and have operated in our existence. So what we've been exposed to as a human being at an early age is going to sit with us and stay with us. Uh, and a lot of times we operate from, well, we do, our subconscious operates 90% of our actions because they're just automatic. So the way we operate in the world as it relates to money has to do with these beliefs that have been with us since we were a child. And so if you are at a place you don't like as it relates to money, it's worth taking a hard look at how your parents handle money. My parents did not teach me one thing about money except they modeled money and how they handled money. And so that is, of course, what happened to me is I did a lot of what they did because that's, that was their beliefs around money and they were my role model as it related to that. And my parents were teachers. So teachers don't get paid well. They did get their master's degree. So my father became an assistant principal and my mother became a guidance counselor. So teachers, as they get advanced degrees, get more of an income. So they were at probably the higher end of a teacher's income, but they still both worked and lived paycheck to paycheck. We lived paycheck to paycheck. And it was always at the end of the month, also teachers get paid once a month, or at least they did. And it was always a crunch at the end of the month. 
And I remember for the longest time, my mother complaining at the end of the month about not having enough money. Like if I wanted something, we don't have enough money. I have to wait for my next paycheck. So those were a lot of what I heard relative to money. They never saved any money. I never heard anything about savings. Uh, I was never taught to save money. I was never taught to give money, donate, or anything like that. Uh, and so, and I'm not criticizing my parents. They didn't know. And they were born in the 30s. And so that was when we were in the midst of a Great Depression. So if you can imagine having parents who lived through that and were probably for the rest of their lives worried about losing money. So that's what they grew up with. So of course, they're going to have a bad relationship with money, probably. They're not going to, well, you'd think they'd save, but, and, and sometimes being around scarcity means it's always going to be scarce to you, right? It doesn't mean that, oh, I'm going to save. It just means that you believe that money is scarce. And so what you create is scarcity around money. And because what happens is the people who lived in depression, in their depression, they didn't feel money was abundant. They, they, it, it lacked. They had a lot of lack around money. And so then you're, the children that you raise who get exposed to this lack mentality, what, what do you suppose happens? They're going to grow up and they're not going to, they're not going to have a relationship with money that's abundant. So they're not going to have savings. They're not going to do savings for the most part. I mean, I totally get how my parents ended up that way. Now I'm not saying that some people won't end up saving, but there's probably going to be some reason or influence to create a more abundant mindset around money uh, that my parents didn't have. So, and it's funny because my father his father was an entrepreneur and he had a gas station and then grew to have more than one gas station. So he was a business owner and my mother's father was high up in the army. He went to West Point and he was a two-star general. So he was really super successful in his life. And he and my grandmother were actually very wealthy. Both sets of my grandparents were wealthy, but they also did hoard their money and they were very worried that they were going to lose it all the time. So, so they have my two parents and my two parents lived paycheck to paycheck. And we were middle class. We lived in a very nice neighborhood. When I was a kid, we, we lived in a middle class neighborhood until I was about 12 we got a pool in our backyard. So not many people have pools in their backyard. See, they were able, always able to scrounge enough money to get something that was nice. But I knew, I knew that they put things on charge cards. I knew that they were always, you know, my mom did the checkbook. My, my dad was kind of oblivious to it. Then when I was 12, we moved to a really nice neighborhood kind of a higher end neighborhood, upper middle class neighborhood, got a pool in our backyard and I got a horse. And again, though, there was all, always a slack mindset. Like we, we don't have enough money for hay. We're gonna, we're gonna have to wait another week for hay. Um, and they built this really cheesy barn. It was not, didn't even have a door. My dad built it and it was, oh my God. I'm not, that's a whole other podcast episode where he, was building it and it fell over one day as he was standing on a ladder, putting the roof on. He was not a construction guy. He was an assistant principal and that's where he should have stayed. But anyways, so my three-sided barn that uh, was just really a lean to that, that my horse could get out of the rain from, but it was always never enough. We didn't have enough money for a barn. We didn't have enough money for this. We didn't have enough money for that. And so that was the relationship that I developed with money is I didn't save. I had a lot of credit card debt. Uh, by the time I started to work at AOL, I was married to a police officer. So you, as you can imagine, the exact same thing that happened to my parents is what I carried forward of this mentality of paycheck to paycheck. And my ex-husband, who was a police officer, 
you know, he, police officers don't make a lot of money either. So I had to work and we made ends meet. We always paid the bills. We never, we were very, very responsible. We never were laid on bills. We always paid the bills, but it was always a worry. And there was a mindset of not enough. And then I was lucky enough to go get a job at AOL. I was, I was, uh, interviewed and hired as a tech writer initially. And at the time, AOL had just gone public and they had only been public for about a year. There were only like 200 people that worked there at the time. And of course, in, in my tenure there, we grew to merge with Time Warner and the employee base grew to 90,000 people. 200 people and 90,000 people. I was there for 13 years, experienced a lot of stock splits. So came very, very wealthy as a result, but it was never because of my mentality changing. It was almost like just sheer luck of being in the right place at the right time. So I worked hard and I got rewarded for it. And my stock account grew and grew and grew. And I'm going to get into some stuff here that I've never shared publicly before, but because I have committed to being open and teaching people through my experiences, uh, then I need to share some of this stuff. And something I'm going to share today is something that came up as a result of a visualization that I did in a retreat last year, visualizations are powerful. And it was a thought, it was like this soul deep hit that I had during this retreat. And it was like this profound aha moment that related to money in my life. And it's something that I was always really ashamed of. And when I pulled this card and the man with the gold coin came up and it was like, I need to share that I'm going through this 30 day, because it's like, James is the man right now. James is the man in my life. Exactly like this described. He is the man who is helpful. And he is giving me sage advice. And I was like, I need to share my story about the fact that I'm doing this. And I'm trying to improve my relationship with money. It's never too late. It's never too late to uncover what is my problem that is holding me back from being afraid to look at my, you know, balance sheet, being afraid to, you know, I, I really procrastinate opening my bank account and it's not like I am not running out of money, but I should be watching like, what if a mistake comes in? Granted, I have some really great financial advisors. And so it has happened that somebody has, has stolen um, and I don't know how it's done. It's, I think sometimes you go to a restaurant and a waiter or waitress takes it and writes it down or somebody sees it, but it's happened a couple of times where my credit card has been used in South America or somewhere, Mexico or something like that. And they catch it and they correct it and they send me a new one, a new credit card and the banks, whatever they do, I, it doesn't come out of my pocket. Thank God I have that set up because that has happened to me but they're the ones who notice it. It's not because I'm going in and looking, okay, what did my statement say last week? And I've been wanting to do that. I've been wanting to do that. And at the end of this 31 day abundance challenge, my goal is to be a much more dedicated financial owner. Like, let me get you to give you an example. I was going through my bills about a week ago which I, again, I procrastinated. I had it on my list for like three days, but it's not the fun thing to do. It's not like my favorite thing to do. I would much rather get on here and talk on my podcast. <laughs> so I did my bills and there was a $497 charge for an annual subscription of a piece of software I used last year that I stopped using. I thought I canceled and it came through my account in May. I'm just being totally honest here, totally honest. Because this could be you, but I want you to know that we have a relationship with money and 
if we're not addressing why we're not being more responsible, that we don't have a good relationship with money, we're avoiders, we're procrastinators, we're uh, living paycheck to paycheck, that might be your case. Um, it was my case, but just by luck and fate, I, I got out of that. But it's quite possible it could return. If I don't get my handle on paying attention and stop procrastinating, yeah, there's a chance that I could return back to my past. And you can manifest that stuff. And so what happened at this retreat and why I want to share this story with you and why it came up for me when I was looking at this, I needed to share this 31-day abundance challenge I'm doing and the fact that we do have a relationship with money. But what I also need to share and get vulnerable about is what happened to me and how I manifested the loss of millions of dollars. Millions. Now, not many of us in this world or life have the opportunity to have millions, and I did. And it's something that I was so, so ashamed of for so long. When I went to this retreat and I had this visualization, I don't, I don't even remember what the visualization was about. All that I know is that when we were done with it, and I became more conscious, you know, because you kind of go into this like unconscious state when you go through these visualizations. And I came back to my awareness and I was like, I need to share the fact that I lost all this money and how ashamed I was of this for whatever reason. It was just an intuitive hit that I needed to get up and share it. And it's so funny because, you know, there's probably like 75 people at this retreat and it's a retreat where we get really vulnerable and it was the second day. And after we do visualizations, people would raise their hand to share. I remember thinking, my, I'm going to see if anybody else is going to share first. Cause oftentimes I feel like sharing and then somebody else has a better share. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to hold back, but nobody else raised their hand. And so I was like, that's a sign. It's a sign that I need to share. So I raised my hand and I shared that I had lost this money and that I had a lot of shame around it. But I realized in that moment that it was really okay. It was okay and it was meant to be. And it's kind of like the shame dissipated. And it was like I needed to express it. It was just like I needed to express it. But what's so interesting is the aha moment. That was not the aha moment. That was just the experience of the visualization that led me to the aha moment that came in the middle of the night that night. So I went back to my Airbnb feeling almost like such a relief and feeling other people came up to me and said, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, they, they felt a deeper connection to me. Some had similar experiences where they did something that probably not to that extent of losing millions of dollars. But anyways, it felt super good to get that off my chest and to know that that didn't define me. That didn't define me. And that's a part of my past. That lesson fuels me. That lesson taught me. That lesson didn't kill me. I'm still here. I survived it, fortunately. And I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose my everything. I was okay. So I went back to my Airbnb that night and I woke up in the middle of the night with this, and it's so crazy how our brain works, how our subconscious is always searching, even when we're not even aware. And so my subconscious gave me a hit 
on what that was all about. It was this most crazy aha moment because I realized in that moment at three o'clock in the morning, sitting straight up in bed, that I manifested that loss, that that loss was something I manifested to happen. And what happened is, I'll take you back to 2004. I was living in a house that was 11,500 square feet. I was living in a house that had nine and a half bathrooms that had a three-tiered fountain in the front and a four-car garage. And it was this massive house. It, the house was so big that as a vice president at AOL, I hosted a party and we had tables in my foyer set up for, there were like 25 or 30 people. So my foyer was a dining room set up for about 30 people. <laughs> so that's how big my house was. And I'm not saying this to brag at all. I'm just telling you that this is the extent of how I was living at the time. And our stock account was huge. At one point, it was $11.5 million. That's how much money <laughs> if we're talking about. And I felt so out of alignment with who I was. And at the time, I didn't even know anything about alignment, honestly. I was making money as a vice president. I was earning an income, living in this big house, and just kind of going through the motions. My kids were in college at the time. So it was just my husband and my, my ex-husband and myself. And I remember one day somebody came to the door and there was a doorbell sound and I answered the door and it was someone selling, soliciting. And I remember her and I remember feeling this overpowering guilt of here she is, someone from the hood probably that I never could imagine living that was out working hard, walking this neighborhood to try to sell magazine subscriptions. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of, I am so sorry. I am so sorry I live in this house and that you can't experience this, that you are having to stand on my doorstep and, and sell me some subscriptions to make a living. I, I just had this, it was just a profound moment that I will never forget. And I remembered it in that middle of the night, my subconscious brought it up at three o'clock in the morning. And so I invited her in. I remember invited her in and I offered her something to drink and she sat at my kitchen table and we talked and I remember buying several <laughs> subscriptions from her. And I remember also solicitors weren't allowed in our neighborhood, but anyways, she made it in. She was great too. I mean, what a great salesperson. And I hope she's skyrocketed and lives in the neighborhood of her dreams, whatever those dreams may be. But I remember when my ex-husband came home from his job and I remember asking him, I said, do you ever feel embarrassed? Do you ever feel awkward that we live here, that we live in this big, huge house? Does it ever make you feel weird? I asked that question. And his response was, no, this is yeah, great. We had a theater. It was a really nice theater, big, huge bar in the basement. Um, but he knew it was fine. He loved it. Didn't bother him at all. And we had an airplane. We had a twin engine airplane. We used to fly to Florida to watch my daughter play soccer. <laughs> so in college, it was kind of nice because we didn't have to drive. We didn't have to take a commercial flight. But I never felt comfortable. That is your inner, that's the inner turmoil. If like, are you embarrassed? That's a sign that you're out of alignment. And of course, I didn't, I didn't realize that then. I didn't know what the heck alignment was. But that's why I love learning and continuing to grow and to read books and to get more in tune with who I am at a soul level, because 
I uncover these things. And these things that would have hounded me for years, years, I would have still been embarrassed about losing all that money. And what happened in that loss is the money just starts vanishing out of my stock account because we didn't cash our stock. We kept the stock in AOL. So I believe that that moment was kind of a real reckoning. I wished I had the knowledge I have now because I would have said, hmm, something is not right here. In the meantime, my stock account is depleting, like by the speed of light almost. I mean, in a matter of months, um, we lost millions. And we kept thinking, and it wasn't, you know, honestly, I don't even think it was that much of a one day I woke up and was like, oh my God, it was like, we kept thinking it was going to come back. And of course I had a good job and we were fine. We did sell that house and we were lucky enough to not lose our shirts on it. We got out before the big drop. So we moved, we downsized to a 7,500 square foot house. Uh, but anyways, the point being is that I had this lack mindset. I had this poor relationship with money. And because I had this lack mindset, I felt like, I mean, think about it. I'm carrying around with me a belief that I live paycheck to paycheck. I have this abundant stock account, but I'm carrying with me this mindset of we're not going to have enough. We're not going to have enough. And I'm not even paying attention to it. I'm in denial that the stock is dropping. Any person with half an ounce of sense would have cashed in a bunch of her stock by now. But I was like hanging on to it because we're going to need it. We're going to need it because we're going to run out of money. And so if you can imagine like clinging on to this money and then being out of alignment, not even wanting to live where I was living in this lavish home, feeling guilty about it, what do you think is going to happen? I'm pushing it all away. I'm pushing it away because what you think about, you bring. It's a law of attraction. What you think about, you attract. So when you think about lack, that's what you're going to bring more of. When you worry about money and when you don't want to deal with these things and you avoid them, it's just going to bring that which you don't want to have in your life. And so I pulled this card and I thought, I'm doing this 31 day abundance challenge with money because I'm trying to improve my relationship with money. I don't ever, ever want to get to the place where I'm living paycheck by paycheck. And gosh, it could happen because I realize I really haven't changed my relationship with money. I'm 61 years old and I'm still operating in this kind of belief system that my parents gave me that I've had since childhood. And so that's like really high on my list to rewire the beliefs that I have around money. I believe I am a much more abundant person. I believe I don't worry. So those are good things. I believe that I have work to do around not avoiding looking at my bank account. Um, I need to get better about having a business mind around my finances. And I also want to be more abundant about the financial impact that I can make in the world. And so it's for that impact that I want to get a hold of this much better. I will say that since I have started my own business, I do donate, which I never did because my parents never did it. And I guess I never learned that. It was never something that was held in with a much importance. And so I have two charities that I donate to every month. And if I had to cut back anywhere, it would not be that. It would not be those. A year and a half ago, that was one of my New Year's resolutions was to start to donate on a regular basis. So I feel that I am in a much more abundant place than I used to be. And I'm thankful that I didn't have to worry. But if I hadn't have been lucky enough to work at AOL and 
to have reaped the benefits of the growth of that company, I guarantee you, I would still be living paycheck to paycheck and I would still be pushing money away from me. So I just want you to examine. And the reason for this episode was for me to get vulnerable to you on what my situation and, and how I'm trying to improve it and how we have a relationship with money, just like we have relationships with people. We have a relationship with money. And if you are struggling in that department, then that needs to be on your priority list to fix because it will never stop. The relationship is the relationship, just like a, a personal relationship. It's a relationship you cultivate. I know there's books and I'll put some in the show notes. One is that I've read Dollars Flow Easily to Me. Another one is A Happy Pocket Full of Money. I just bought that book. So I'm going to be reading that. And then there's some others that have been recommended. There was one that was done by, uh, gosh, what was the book? I, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. She tells her story of how one day she was manifesting money and a thousand dollars dropped onto her car. <laughs> She's driving along and a thousand dollars dropped onto her car. I forget the name of that book, but I'll put it in the show notes as well. But I read that one. That was really good. And I think she does boot camps online. So hopefully this has helped. Hopefully being vulnerable and letting you know that I lost a shitload of money <laughs> is helpful to you. Uh, but I think what's even more important is that I'm not ashamed of it anymore. And I can speak about it and I can use it as fuel and know that. I now know why. And I now know that I can manifest. If I can manifest it disappearing, you can manifest it appearing. Right? All right. So that's my Thursday thought for today. Talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own, not your average life.